Welcome everyone to this week's, this bi-weekly Wednesday webinar. And today we're going to be talking about creating bicycling communities. We got a host of great guests today. Um, I'll start with myself. I'm not a guest, but I'm the host. My name is Eric De Silva. I'm the education associate education director for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. I assume many of you know about the coalition. Our mission is to make Maine a better place for biking and walking. And we've been doing that for over 30 years now. Our sponsor, thank you very much, is Tandem Coffee. And they have a couple locations in Portland. They also have uh, sales in 16 states. They'll ship anywhere you'd like them to. And if you're in the one Portland location, you can also get baked goods, which I've been there a couple of times and their baked stuff is pretty yummy. Baked stuff in general is good, but they make some really good baked stuff. So thank you, Tandem Coffee. So with us today, we have four folks from Portland Bike Party. We have Emma and Elias. Emma is the co-founder and Elias, uh, he liked, he called himself the lead party enabler. So the bike party is all about enabling a party attitude, a party, a healthy party attitude. And so he's a lead volunteer for, for leading those rides. Tyler Punk is in Lewiston. He heads Queers for Gear. He's a co-organizer and group leader. He's also an employee at a Rainbow Bicycle. And he is their local expert on virtual riding. So we might get into that a little bit. And then also in the Portland area, we have Taylor, who heads up Maine Cycling in that area. And he's the founder of that group. And the idea behind these bicycle communities that all of our guests have created today is that they're developing ways for each of us to feel like we're in a community where we can see people riding their bikes, where when we go out on a bike, we don't feel alone. And if you wanna have a group atmosphere and go on a fun ride, that that opportunity is going to exist. So our goal today is to help each of you understand the motivations that led to the development of these rides and also how you can do that yourself in whatever nook of Maine you find yourself in. I know that we have people from pretty far south in Maine, and I know for a fact there's at least some people in the Bangor area. I'm not sure if we have any, any people in like the down east or like Arusta County area, but if you're there, like say something into the, the chat quick and, and welcome yourself. We'd love to know kind of where you are in the state. If anyone has any questions, or a comment about anything that we're talking about, please use the chat feature in Zoom. My colleague, Anne, is gonna be monitoring that. And so uh, we'll make sure that that gets brought right into the conversation at that time, if it, if it seems fitting, or we'll definitely make sure we cover any questions at the end of today's webinar. Uh, my first, my first uh, community group ride that I can remember um, in the sense that we're gonna be talking about them today, so not like in the woods and kind of rowdy, but like going through a sort of an urban developed area was in Philadelphia and it was one of these mass rides. And I think one of the differences between that mass ride, which was now 20 years ago, and what we're gonna talk about today is that that mass ride was kind of lawless and it was it felt exhilarating. I was not in the advocacy world at all at that point. And it was just hundreds of people on bikes riding through downtown, down city, Philadelphia. And I don't remember it stopping at red lights. I don't remember anyone really being very respectful to other users on the road. That is something I'm interested in talking to all of you about today. Like, how do you maintain uh, maintain our our community as as good apples so that we're respectful to everyone else on the road? But let's start with talking about some origin stories and maybe Emma and Elias from Portland Bike Party. If you could just quickly. Uh, talk about how you got involved with community bike development in the first place, or maybe what even brought you into the world of bicycling and advocacy in the first place. And like, just spend a couple of minutes and we'll, we'll go through everyone and kind of see where some of the foundations lie here. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to kick it off. So, um, I think personally, the way that I got into biking, it was, it was always transportation for me. Um, the first time in my life when I was a regular bike commuter was when I started working in restaurants when I was in college and I would get off work really late. Um, and 
I was in Boston, the bus wasn't running regularly at that hour. And I honestly, I just felt really safe on my bike, um, way safer than I felt walking home. And so I just started getting really into biking everywhere I went. I felt, it felt exhilarating. And then like the next step was getting all my friends to bike places with me. And so when you were bringing up your experience, Eric, of like your first mass ride, like I just think of like groups of friends getting out and being like, let's all just hop on our bikes and go somewhere. It sadly doesn't happen that often in my life anymore, um, which was part of the reason why me and a couple other folks wanted to start bike party was like was really just can we get a bunch of our friends to go ride bikes around together again because that's the best <laughs> so that's my that's my personal entrance into group rides i have a lot more to say about where bike party started but i'll, I'll let someone else thanks emma elias do you want to add anything to that Uh, no, um, uh, uh, very little. Uh, I, I first discovered social riding in Austin, Texas. Um, and so for me, uh, bike riding is a huge part of uh, mental health. Um, I really need it in order to, you know, keep everything uh, going straight. And when I discovered group rides, it was like even better to the nines. So when I moved back to Maine, one of the first things I started doing is looking for a group ride. And that was right around COVID. Um, which obviously threw a monkey wrench in, in everybody's works. Um, but I discovered a couple of rides, uh, Emma's bike party, and then the first Friday ride, which has been going since 2009 and um, just, you know, became a regular on both. Bikes and our, our mental health are a great connection. I think that's something that all of us can agree on. Uh, I, I feel the same way. If I'm having a low day, I usually hop on a bike and like bring some energy, like positive energy back into myself. Um, Tyler, can you give yourself a quick introduction and how Queers and Gear came to be? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I, I kind of got uh, started in the bike world as like a, a fitness health journey, uh, which I quickly learned was also a, like not just physical, but but mental, as as you were just saying, is that you kind of get addicted to the the, the feeling that it, it creates, you know, the happiness that it creates. Um, that kind of led to me, uh, I, I sort of spent the first month of my uh, fitness journey gearing up to uh, do the Dempsey Challenge, uh, which meant I was spending a lot of time going to Rainbow Bicycle, getting gear, to asking questions, things like that, um, which uh, eventually actually led to the owner offering me a job. Um, so he kind of jokes, John uh, kind of jokes that I, I started coming and just just never left. Uh, that eventually turned into daily commuting. I, I ride to work every day. I've 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 ridden all winter, which has been uh, quite a quite a fun thing to to kind of do. Um, but that that uh, um, uh, at some point uh, led to me meeting a couple friends in town. Um, who also enjoy biking, especially at the commuter level. Um, and we are uh, we kind of met through a queer social circle, so we all started kind of discussing this idea of a a queer ride, um, something that is kind of you know all all inclusive, uh, you know, bringing people together to to feel comfortable, um, but to also meet each other. That that type of kind of building of community, um, and that kind of led to us eventually creating this this queers and gear ride. Um, which we've we've which which I would say is is a passion project and and kind of still uh, in development for us, which is is where I'd say my kind of uh, uh, perspective on the the curating of of rides, uh, the the kind of lens that I would have in in this this scenario uh, is that we're still kind of in the works to make this thing happen. Um, we're still kind of building on this idea and and trying to get to. Um, not that it, there's ever necessarily an end point, but um, kind of, you know, where we can keep going to, to get people out and, and make this something available to, to anyone who, who wants it. Does the in gear part of the, the name invoke any other parts besides just cycling? Do you also do hiking or boating? We, we've actually chatted about that. Um, we, we had joked that we wanted to, uh, not that this is necessarily a physical activity, but to, to potentially go tubing this, this winter. Um, uh, it, it didn't happen. Both both Maya and I, who um, I, actually I should have mentioned that Maya is my my kind of co-leader, co-creator. Um, 
we uh, uh, we never ended up getting to that point. Both of us have been really busy this winter, but um, the, the idea is definitely kind of uh, uh, creating a place where we can we can you know shout these things out online and 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 bring us together. So yeah, we kind of work through um, an organization here in Lewiston um, called LA. It's happening queer. Uh, which is a, a friend of ours, Alex, who kind of is who introduced Maya and I, and, and Alex kind of um, is this sort of an, an enabler of of social queer events. So um, it's all kind of you know building on like you know adding to this this list of things that's that's offered here in Lewiston, like queer clothing swaps and and things like that. So we're kind of add, adding cycling to this list of already kind of you know community or oriented events. Yeah, that's great because community should be more than just just bikes. Yeah. Okay, Taylor from Portland, Maine, cycling. Can you are you there now? Yeah, there you are. Can you yep. uh, do the same thing? Let, let us know your origin and how that led you to developing Maine cycling. Yeah, um, I kind of never stopped cycle like riding my bike as a kid, and then getting into BMX as a teenager, and then in college got into fixed gear uh and then moved my way into road and then now I kind of just ride whatever I uh, just kind of like all aspects uh, of riding now um I never really rode with other people besides like maybe one or two people for a really long time um I rode my first group ride with the gear hub actually um I did a trail ride uh, my friend Luke who works at um Tandem was leading that uh and I had the worst time because I was on the wrong bike uh and <laughs> decided that I didn't like trails and I didn't like group rides but then I gave it another try um I the idea of some of the like road groups that are around around town was really um daunting to me uh like I wasn't going to be strong enough I wasn't going to be fast enough so I didn't want to like go and have a bad time um I got to the point where I I can keep up with those groups and that's fine, but I wanted something that was a real intro into being able to go on like a road group ride. And no matter what level you're at, you could go on and actually have a good time and not worry about getting left behind or feeling like you're not strong enough or not fast enough. I just wanted it to be a fun community thing. Um, that's kind of community is something that is really important to me. Um, and I, it's kind of the thing that I always focus on when I'm creating an idea in my brain about anything, if it's a business or a group or something, I just, I think that community forward is always the way to think about things. Um, I think that's how they succeed. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks Taylor. So with all, of, with all of you, these organizations, one thing that I'm I'm feeling like is that these are not, you're not catering to people that want to have a group that rides fast, like a, like a classic road ride group on like a Wednesday night would do. So if you were to put it out there, like what are the, what style of rider or what, what, what should someone expect when they show up to one of these rides, as far as like the speed, the tempo, the vibe, what, how do you make sure that people are comfortable before they even show up, that they take an interest and feel confident in themselves? I'd say uh, it's it's a lot of, um, that's like a really in-depth conversation that Maya and I have had um, about our ride in particular is like, how, who are we gearing this ride towards and how do we make that so that it is still available for anyone uh, that, that, that comes um, and it's really hard in particular for ours because we have that added, you know, kind of layer of, of um, where we're gearing this towards queer people. Um, so we, we've kind of been um, a big advocate for just like a, making sure we have a really good sweep, a really well laid out, you know, kind of route, uh, which we keep within kind of loosed and bounds um, that we can present to people so that we can like let them know that the, this is where we're going to be. Uh, this is, you know, who's going to be keeping, you know, you you up with everyone else so that you know where you are um, and kind of, you know, her and I working together as best we can because, you know, we're, we're not like a massive ride yet. Um, and so just just kind of, you know, keeping it so that, uh, you know, the the fastest person can enjoy it just as much as you know the, the person who's going to be hanging out in the back 
is yeah. the general idea that you're welcoming all ages, all abilities? Maybe someone else could speak to that too. For for our our ride in particular, um, yes, uh, and it's been it's been um, kind of a, a judgment call. Um, Maya and I keep usually like a a back burner of of rides, um, depending on who shows up, um, because if we you know have a sort of um, faster ish, we we never go very fast, um, but a faster ish group show up, um, you know we might we might add a little bit more to it. It's something I guess we kind of have conversations before the ride starts with 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 who shows up about you know how are we feeling this day, what are we what are we thinking of doing, where are we thinking of going, even though we have that kind of designated route uh, that we initially kind of present. Um, we keep it open-minded uh, <laughs> to, uh, um, you know, potentially adjusting that uh, depending on, you know, what, what we're doing that day and, and, and who's showing up. I can't speak for Elias. I wish, I wish I could read your mind, but I, um, I can add just, I mean, Portland bike parties, definitely all ages, all abilities. And if you've come to our ride, you know, we do not ride fast. <laughs> we ride very slow. Um, partially by necessity because we have gotten really big. So we have hundreds of people. Um, and we we put in place a lot of things, like Tyler said, like we have a sweep, um, we have a lead, we have walkie talkie. So the sweep and the lead can communicate like when we're blocks apart from each other um, to slow down, to speed up. Um, and then having grown, it's, one of the wonderful things of bringing more and more people into the fold has been able being ha, being able to have the support for people who are on the ride. Like we'll have, um, we have a medic that we assign at each ride. We have, um, you know, we have maintenance people. We have people who can go fix a flat. We've probably fixed a flat on like three quarters of bike party rides. Somebody has, um, because things do come up when you get that many bikes in one place. So, um, yeah, we've had babies and and uh people who are older and all in between yeah i'll say um we um do uh a, like a an 18 plus just because we are on some tighter roads sometimes uh because it is kind of more of like a little bit more on the traditionally road route most of the time but with the slower pace and so we just we just don't want to be we had kids hop in on one ride and we were like riding through cape elizabeth and it felt really like unsafe to be going on an 18 mile ride with kids that just like hopped in um on just like whatever bike and so after that uh just for safety purposes uh for us and the gear hub we don't want to we didn't want to not have like waivers signed for children <laughs> um so we did go a little up on that uh we did make sure that it was uh adult only kind of situation um but the pace wise i i really try to make sure that we um or like any of our posts are making sure that people know that it is like a chill like below 12 miles an hour ride um if you'd ask my husband at the beginning of the season if he thought i could do that um he would have told you no but i got really good at it <laughs> Um, with with help of things like a walkie-talkie that I got from uh, Bike Party um, and a sweep um, friend, our friend Nick, um, who's good friends with everyone at the Bike Party in the in the first Friday ride. Um, he was a phenomenal sweep for me all summer um, and really helped keep us paced and also just be on top of it. if there was any flats or anything and let us know. So that really helps us be able to like not lose each other. And even if there, like, if there is a flat, we'd all wait and just hang out and just, you know, chill for a few minutes and catch back up. We take little breaks in between to, if there is a little bit of a gap, sometimes shows up, but yeah, we try our best to keep it chill. Yes. So one of the things you just brought up, Taylor, I, for me at least is always, would be always a concern. And that's the, the liability of these types of events. So you mentioned waivers and that you would feel uncomfortable with youth joining the ride without having a proper waiver signed by a parent guardian. Do you have waivers? And, and same question to everyone else here, but how do you handle general liability? And do you have everyone sign a waiver beforehand? I, I, I sure as heck did not sign a waiver before joining the Philly Mass Ride, but um, I'm wondering about these more more uh, sculpted rides, whether, they, whether you require that and um, whether the answer is yes or no, 
what are your thoughts as far as liability go? We, since I do um, collaborate with the GearHub a lot, we have the GearHub has a waiver um, that is attached to um, some of our stuff, but it isn't required. Um, we do kind of go on the hope that everyone's an adult uh, and everyone understands the risk of going on a, a bike ride, um, that it is a little assumed, but we try to go over safety as much as possible. Um, but I, sometimes I think that uh, it is it is good to have something like that just for anybody who's organizing an event like that's own safety too. How about Queers and Gear and Portland Bike Party? How do you handle, I, I see Elias has put in, fun is guaranteed, safety is not. That's a nice way to like kind of excuse yourself from holding someone else's liability. Um, do you do that in formal practice as well? Do you not require any waivers and do you kind of let people know that they're there on their own accord? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd say that we're kind of, we don't, we don't have people sign waivers. Um, I think a big part of um, our kind of idea is, you know, yeah, pre pre present people. We always, you know, give the the talk before the ride of, you know, that this is how we're going to do. This is where, you know, if we if we happen to go into a, a, a road because we're we're typically uh, trying to keep off of of main roads in queers and gear um, uh, as best we can. Uh, but if there are sections, we let people know kind of ahead of time uh, that the this section is you know, this type of, of, you know, traffic, uh, and this is how we're going to handle it kind of, you know, riding defensively, um, th things like that. But I, I guess we, we present people with, uh, kind of how we're going to be safe on these rides, um, and kind of hold them to those standards. And, uh, if, if I, I guess we haven't encountered this yet, but, you know, I guess it would be a conversation had with somebody if, if they're not kind of, um, kind of following with what our expectations are that 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 would kind of um you know this is where we're at this is why we're doing this it's important um thankfully we haven't encountered that yet so um but i guess that's kind of where we're at is the expectation that you know we know what we're doing here we know we, we should know how to handle ourselves if we don't feel free to ask we'd love to teach you about road safety and and you know kind of how we want to handle ourselves and present ourselves to this community and and to, you know to ourselves that's very much how local bike shop rides are too you don't show up and sign a waiver you kind of show up there's a grounded expectation that everyone's going to be riding on good behavior and if there is an issue it's taken care of in a reasonable way yeah uh Portland Bike Party, Emma or Elias, anything to add to what we've what's been mentioned already regarding general liability? Yeah, I mean, like Elias said, um, we do say fun is guaranteed and safety is not. I mean, we we definitely Elias has a really good um, pre ride spiel, and but we've always done that. We've always you know started off the rides with some expectations and some. Um, you know, like we're all here in this space together. Um, we say ride cool, which kind of sums up a lot um, of just being respectful to all road users to each other. Um, you know, the like the type of behavior we want to see and then also the safety um, sort of expectations. Um, but our approach is that people are coming and um, are responsible for for themselves while they're there. Um, we're you know, I, our faces are out here now, but we kind of run ourselves like a, a decentralized group. So um, there are many, many, many people involved in the organizing of a bike party and we're not a formal organization or anything by any means. Cool. So hey, I, I tried switching out my audio. Sorry about the glitch before. Can you hear me all right now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Uh, we still, once in a while, we get some hicc hiccups. Uh, last summer in August, I think, there was a guy who showed up to the ride with a kid literally under his arm. Like he was riding with like a baby uh, one hand on the handlebars. And so, you know, we had to like, we're going to, we're going to have a, a, a chat with this fella, but you know, 99% um, of the time, the group actually, you know, once you start riding with people together, the group kind of sets its own tone. And, and, you know, if, if you're, if you're chilling, having a good time, then, then everybody else kind of, most for the most part falls in the line. Uh, that's pretty wild. I've never seen someone doing that at a group ride before <laughs> or trying to participate like that. 
So a reminder to everyone that's joining us, please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question or drop that question into the chat. Otherwise, I'll just keep rolling along with my own my own questions here. So let's um so next question on my list is really like for for folks that are interested in doing this, how do you decide like how frequently you ride with a group that you put these things out there? It certainly takes planning on your end. So I'm sure there's like some level of like how much how much time do I have to put into doing this? And you don't want to oversaturate. So what's what type of event frequency do you decide upon? And do you have a season? I'm I've got a season. I kind of go for the when you've got light um from April to October, I think was when when we went this last year. Um I had actually talked been talking to Ainsley from the Gear Hub for like the last three years about at least hosting a group ride for them or like helping lead a group ride like for them. Um until this last summer I didn't really have the time. So like when it comes to like how much time it takes or like when the regularity comes in, it wasn't until I actually had time to be able to be like, oh I can do it every week. That's fine. Cause now I work from home and it's something that I look forward to every week because I get to go socialize because I spent the last seven years working in coffee shops and now I don't see anyone all day. So now it's nice for me to go see 40 people and hang out for a couple hours. So I'm more than happy to do it once a week because it's my reason to drive into town and go ride with folks doing my favorite thing and socializing. So, I mean, so and towards the end of the summer, we started doing a Tuesday morning ride too. So we were actually kind of doing a couple a week. So you got about 40 people, two hours, or maybe like anywhere from 15 to 20 miles. Does that kind of sum up a typical ride? Yeah, for us, yeah, it's it's typically 15 to 20 miles. Um, and yeah, it'll take about two hours, depending on as long as we don't have too many flats. And then we'll we usually go to Oxbow afterwards and hang out. You try and you you kind of said earlier that you like to sometimes you just end up stopping to fix a flat tire or something. Do you try to build in regular stops to kind of develop that like uh, develop an opportunity to socialize? Yeah, we have a f uh, depending on the route. Um, I will have some planned gathering stops and we'll stop and have a snack and chat. And um, we do the like uh, the lighthouse tour kind of. So that one we stop at the the array of light, the three lighthouse kind of route, um, go to the headlight and the other two that my brain is leaving me on their names right now, bug and yep. The other one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and then we'll, yeah, we just try to Pretty stop. Point. Thank you, Spring Point. Yep. But yeah, I try to build those in. Sometimes the when we go like north to Falmouth, there's not really a whole lot of good stopping. So we will we'll just kind of find places if we need to recollect and we'll kind of make that work. But what about Portland bike party? Um, and then we'll we'll ask Tyler the same question for queers and gear. So like frequency, season, and then like what is it what does a typical group look like? As far as numbers, distance, terrain. Uh, so let's see. We um, we go all year round, and we've sort of adjusted how we've approached that. I really appreciated. Um, also, I just want to shout out Jesse, who's also here as a bike party organizer. Um, the group decided uh, after doing two. I think we did two full years of year round monthly rides, once a month, the third Friday. Um, and then we hit winter number three and there were just, it was just the weather had the prior winter had been all over the place and we ended up moving rides and doing a lot of rescheduling and it was just a lot of extra labor. Um, and so we decided to go to a Sunday daytime ride in the winter months and then, um, stick with the Friday night bike party in the, in the warmer months. It's, a, it's been pretty fun. And I think it, it's been able to help us reach other people who couldn't typically join on Friday nights, whether they like work in the industry um, or, you know, that's bedtime for their kids or whatnot. Um, and I'll let Elias take the other part of the question around like what our rides look like and how many people, how long, what the terrain is. Yeah. So uh, the winter rides, um, those tend to be smaller and more committed. Um, so January, February have been 20, 25, 30 people. 
Uh, so in a lot of ways, those are more fun for us as organizers because we don't have to worry about the crowds. There are no, you know, if there's a flat, somebody knows how to fix it on their own. Um, we can, you know, we don't have to worry so much about uh, trail conditions and things like that. Um, so yeah, winter is a little bit of a break for us in the afternoons, 20 to 30 people, more chill. Um, all of our rides have a halfway point built in that we call either the party stop or the dance stop. Basically, when you take the cyclists off their bikes and put some music on, their legs keep moving and it just turns into dance party. Um, that's uh, that's a big part of Jesse's contribution. We call him the, uh, the director of musical entertainment. Um, so the the party stop will also have some other, we'll, we'll come up with some other zaniness. Um, Jesse brought a CO2 cannon a few times. I have a little travel electric guitar and amp that uh, I can bust out. Um, Fred and Kathy, some other regulars, will uh, they'll drive and bring hula hoops to the party shop so we can have some hooping while we're there. Um, over the summer, things are different. Um, in those big rides, you know, when it's up like over 200 people, we are just in 100% crowd control mode. We rehearse the route um, like a like a sporting event or a, a parade. Um, we fine tune a lot of details about where we're going. And then as far as people who shows up, it's totally across the board. There'll be, you know, um, road dudes in Lycra with the carbon fiber sometimes. Um, there's a lot of families, uh, you know, who five, five kids who drag the stuff out of the, the barn. Um, people will bring art bikes. There's a guy who's got the, the tall bike, two frames welded together. So it's like a, um, a bike on stilts. Um, and then uh, actually I was thinking about this when my audio was out. Um, Right in August, we had, I was sweeping and we had um, two older ladies who had brought their like um, uh, motorcycle handlebar banana seat 70s bikes. And I'm guessing they hadn't been on those in maybe 10 or 15 years, right? And they're not light bikes to begin with. So, you know, we announced that it's like a five to 10 mile ride and we ride at 10 miles an hour, you know, which is pretty chill for most people. But these ladies were, were having a tough time. There was also a guy, a guy in a recumbent with the hand pedals. And he was keeping up, but he was kind of struggling on on some of the hills and stuff. So uh, we have the walkie talkies and a radio to head to Nick. Um, uh, as Taylor mentioned, he, he does bike party sometimes too. I said, "Hey man, slow it down a couple miles an hour. We're really struggling back here, and we like the group to stay together in a tight pack." Didn't think much about it, you know. The other thing about a sweep is I was like encouraging people to you know uh, keep up. But when we got back to the end stop and I saw people. Uh, getting ready to leave, I saw the guy with the, the hand bike was going to get in his car with his uh, with his partner. And as he was putting it in, he, he jumped out and got in a wheelchair. And I was like, man, that's so cool because I didn't even think of that while we were on the ride. I just thought he brought that bike because, you know, people bring all kinds of different bikes. And isn't that like the, the definition of inclusiveness that it didn't even occur to me on the ride that, you know, he had different needs. We just slowed down a little bit for him. So a lot of accommodation, a lot of work goes into those big ones. That's great. Thank you so much for all that. Uh, so, and you're talking about 200 people on the road. Do you have to involve public safety with this? Do you, or do you just follow the rules of the road and keep it, keep it cool and healthy? No, we had kind of a freak out on Reddit one time. Uh, some anti-bicycle folks like reported us to the city through their, their, their thing. And the city was like, we, we just don't care. You know, we have like murders and, and drug addiction and like these people are that actually somebody knows someone who's a ranking officer in the police and asked them about bike party. He was like, they seem like they're having a good time. We have zero concerns about it. And, you know, we, we put a lot on ourselves to plan it. And, um, but uh, the one thing, actually, one of the things we shout at the beginning, the one thing that we've ever gotten hassled about is people riding over the, the double yellow line. So you'll hear us shouting with those big groups. When we get on a side street, people start to take, they start to bleed over into the other lane. You'll hear us shouting all the time, stay to the right, stay to the right, because that's the only, that's the only thing the cops have ever done this hard time. About. Yeah. And before, like through email, Elias, you had recommended that the San Jose, right? bike party was one that had sort of inspired you um, or maybe it hadn't inspired you, but you saw it as a good model. And so one of the things that they always talk about is this um, quote, roll past conflict end quote, which is this idea that when you, I, I really like this idea a lot, especially when you're in a bike party sort of atmosphere, you're going to find people out there that just want to hate on you so bad. And the idea with the roll past conflict is that you're, you're really just, embodying the relaxed chillness of the mission and you're rolling past you're not like buying into that hate yourself um but there's a lot of 
there's a lot of uh, formality with the safety as far as like making sure people are doing the right thing. So Emma mentioned that you have like a dialed free ride safety chat. Can you sum that up in like a minute or two? Yeah, the, the core of it is what she said about ride cool. So I, I have this slogan that just sort of sums it up. Ride cool. Pretend you're at a party, right? What's cool to do at a party? Sing at the top of your lungs, get crazy and dance, get a little crazy. What's not cool? Getting really crazy, littering, getting wasted, getting hurt. Um, what's not cool? Getting hassled by the cops, state of the right. Uh, so another thing I say is I've been doing social rides now for 10 years, going back to Austin. 99% of the people on the road love us. They shout and wave and honk and they're happy. 1% of all people in the world hate fun. And so when you run into one of these people, what do you do? And it's a crowd response. They say, ride cool. Keep riding. One of our party enablers will stop and talk to them. But the idea of, yeah, ride cool is like, just keep on going. You know, if somebody's mad, let them be mad and we just ride cool. So when you talk to somebody, you're a party enabler. What's the conversation you're going to have with someone that hates fun? Yeah. So um, there was a great one a couple of years ago uh, said, you know, hey, thanks for stopping. This is Portland Bike Party. We'll be through here in just a minute. Appreciate your patience. Right. And then actually a lot of times people kind of, oh, OK, you know, they're they're a little grumpy. But um, this one guy says, uh, he says, what is this, the loser parade? And our, our friend Dylan said, well, no, I just told you it's Portland Bike Party like completely dead hand, you know but on the other hand it's like hey there's like there's 200 of us and one of you we're out here like grooving to you know some hot tunes and you're upset in your car so i actually cultivate a compassion i'm like you know you're actually having a much worse time than i am so i feel for you buddy that's great okay one one more that's tied into safety uh especially because you're you're operating with 200 people on the road how do you handle stop signs and traffic lights. So we've had a debate about that. Um, San Jose Bike Party runs up to, they're like 15 years old and they get up to like 1500 people. Like, so when you're running that many people through a city, you know, you're traffic, right? So they stop at, at all the intersections. Our group is bordering on the point where it's like, does it make more sense for us to stop or to get everybody through, right? Um, you know, part of the way I think about it at the current size we're at is we're like one of those like uh, tractor trailers with an oversized one. You know what I mean? Or like, um, you know, like a small parade. Uh, and it's actually better for the group to stay together because then we get out of your way um, more efficiently. We're thinking about that because right now we might block an intersection, you know, depending on the intersection, if there's one key place we need to get through, we might block it off for, you know, it could take 30 seconds for us to get through. Um, we're getting to the point where if we get too much larger, we're not going to be able to do that. The problem with splitting the intersection is that you need way more of a cadre of trained volunteers, because if you stop for a light, then whoever stopped at that light becomes the leader, right? So they have to be capable of leading the ride from that point. Um, internally, we do a ton of work. We meet four times a year outside a bike party. We call it the summit. Uh, and, and we plan and talk about one of the things we're working on is we're trying to build a bench of volunteers. We're, we're soliciting more help from the community. We're trying to um, cultivate the people who are really interested to become leaders and sweepers and mechanics and route planners and, and basically uh, to possibly like take over um, for all of us if, if any of us move on. Um, so yeah, next, this summer, we're actually, you know, we, we have a plan to do a volunteer drive uh, starting this spring. I see Dusty posted in chat, man, you're in, uh, we gotcha. Um, we're going to do a volunteer drive this spring. We train people, um, we kind of get them familiar, but you know, we are also concerned about the size of the ride managing it. Over the summer, that's a, that's a huge focus for us. And we put a lot of time and effort into thinking about that. So building like a, a bench, uh, a deep uh, staff of volunteers is really important. Yeah, it seems like route development too, all on its own could play a huge role in making the ride on the day of a lot easier to manage. If you can skip straight or left turns through traffic, red traffic lights, that type of thing. Um, let's move on. So Tyler, um, didn't get a chance to ask you the same question, but uh, you sort of hedged a little bit earlier on like what the feeling of your rides were. And one of the questions that came through chat was re regarding 
includes including folks that may not be strong riders they're maybe they're elderly maybe they're brand new to cycling maybe they're like they've just learned how to ride a bike whether they're a kid or an adult so with your rides tyler like what do you how do you make sure that anyone that might show up is going to be taken care of and have a good positive experience yeah, I think that's what's kind of the cool thing about Maya and I is that, um, and I'll actually include Alex in that who uh, runs that, that LA at Happening Queer, is that we all kind of love teaching. Um, we all kind of have like a, a teaching lens about about cycling. Um, and so I, I think a big part of that is, you know, we want to educate you. We want to take the time to, if, if we have to stay five minutes extra at the beginning of the ride uh, to let people know, you know, this is kind of the safety that you you should you know want to achieve while you're out here. Um, you know, that's 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 what we're interested in doing, and I think that's a big part of like the inclusive part of it. Um, we've even actually discussed my and I doing like a you know we'll show up half an hour early if you want to bring your bike. Uh, my and I both uh, being bike mechanics will take the time to uh, either teach you about uh, you know what you need to to know about your own bike or just fix things that aren't going right uh, just to provide you know that that space for people who who really are you know could be very green to this who just might not know um and so i think a part of that as well which kind of um might actually kind of link with with what everyone was just talking about uh is that our routes as well uh maya and i spend a lot of time working on routes that are um pretty much every low trafficked road that we can potentially find and be able to link together um and and kind of the idea behind that is that um if we have people show up who just aren't as comfortable as you know like i i i, I do do kind of um I, I don't want to say aggressive road rides, but sometimes they feel a little aggressive road rides. Like I, I go to that section of riding as well. Um, so I get to see both both perspectives um, of what people might not want to do. <laughs> uh, and so I, I think part of that is that we gear our rides on, you know, we kind of um, link very low traffic neighborhoods. A lot of times we're going on like a walking path that goes through Lewiston, which is, you know, about a mile and a half of our ride. Um, and then typically linking on to uh, actually one of our favorite routes is kind of what I'm referencing uh, is kind of, you know, walking path through like a very low traffic neighborhood. Uh, and we actually go down a, an, another kind of maybe two mile stretch of a road that goes to the Lewiston Hydro Dam. Um, and so, yeah, a big part of that is like we, 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 you know, having a good sweep, being able to educate people, um, just, you know, providing a space that people feel comfortable in, which is obviously the biggest part of our, our ride, which I'm sure as, as most people want that to be a part of their ride, um, we try to take extra steps to make that a thing, um, being, you know, a queer ride in particular. Um, and so, yeah, it's a big part of like just being willing to take the time to to educate people, to help people out, to, to teach them, um, a, a friend of the ride, um, when we first started out had a bike that um i'd say was kind of working against him um he ended up deciding to buy it buy a new bike um and uh this was outside of the ride but uh, you know i took the time to 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 go out on a ride with him and just teach him you know like these are kind of ideas of how to shift correctly and in, in whatever scenario and things like that just so that while he's on our ride um, you know, he can feel more comfortable, feel like he's not struggling as much. Uh, and, and so I feel like it's, you know, just taking the time to to care and give your time to people. Yeah, so with the same person that asked that original uh, question, Tyler, um, thank you for answering it. And I'm skimming through it right now. Um, one thing that is being said is that uh, you mentioned you could highlight the fact in publicity, in doubt, a lot of would-be riders just don't show up in my experience, you miss out on a lot. So I think what that's getting to is, um, in reality, if a person shows up and they're new to new to this, you'll take them under your wing and really help them feel comfortable. But before they even show up, there's a lot of hesitation. Um, so it, do you try to get the word out through marketing that we're going to be hosting, like, I, would, I don't want to say like an adult learn to ride event, but maybe like something along the lines where someone who's just a step beyond that would feel comfortable coming and feel like they're not going to hold anyone up. Is that, and yeah. is that going to be a question for anyone else here? Like, do you, do you put it out there and bike party sounds like a little bit of a different, different type of party, <laughs> but maybe uh, like Taylor and Tyler's feel a little bit more like a, uh, like a club ride. That's on a very chill 
like like slow roll atmosphere so yeah the question again is like how do you make people feel um like they're going to show up to something and their expectations are going to be the same as the people that are hosting the ride yeah so uh i think one of the really cool things that that happened kind of referencing this uh is that we actually had somebody um show up at one of our rides last year just just at the beginning uh who said i i I don't even have a bike. I don't know how to ride bikes, but I wanted to come and talk to you all uh, just to just to learn about this. Um, so I, I'm guessing something we're doing must be working right. Hopefully, um, I, I'd say that uh, it's actually a great kind of kind of on our list of thing to work on is like how do we reach out uh, e even better, um, specifically to to an older crowd. But um, I'd say, yeah, maybe maybe getting those workshops out there more of like, you know, come half an hour before, you, even if you don't ride with us, we can we can teach you things. Um, and if you do ride with us, we're going to make sure that you're in good hands. Um, so I guess, you know, yeah, it would be that's a that's a I suppose a work in progress of how do we very specifically highlight uh, that this is, you know, where you're going to be in kind of a good, good space with us. Emma, Elias or Taylor? Anything yeah um i mean kind of along those lines i mean i try my best to like in any of my posters or posts or anything to be very clear about how like the fact that you like you're not going to get left behind uh someone's always going to be with you and like you will make it through the whole ride together um i think that i mean we have a pretty wide age range uh that comes to the main cycling the thursday night ride um which is pretty cool. Um, but I, yeah, I kind of just hope that the, the message goes across by really hammering in the like no drop fun pace. Let's just have a good time. Um, but I also like to suggest um, the bike main safety courses, uh, especially for getting started. I think that those are really good. Um, like when you guys have those in the beginning, uh, uh or like in the springtime Taylor's or whenever ride you do as, a, as a participant um so i showed up on i think the last uh thursday ride last summer and um mm -hmm. it's interesting you mentioned that because that one was like super technical like kind of gnarly we went oh, through like yeah. kanko woods and there was like some like roots and rock but you said you you said when you promoted it you were like this one's going to be different. There's going to be a really like yeah. technical route. If you if you're gravel or skinny tires, we're going to have an alternate where you can go around and meet up with us later. And you were very clear about it. So the reason I actually wanted to bring that up is that I feel like no drop is a misnomer. None of our mm -hmm. rides can possibly be no drop because like uh, one time somebody showed up to bike party and their derailleur was rusted solid and they threw the chain almost immediately and it just wasn't, I'm sorry, like you're out. So at that point, like this person is not going to be able to participate in the ride at all. If we we're truly no drop, then does everybody have to stop? Instead, I think what we need to be is we need to be super clear about the conditions when we will drop, right? Like this is going to be a more aggressive ride or this is going to be off road or something like that. Or, you know, in bike party, we, when we have 200 people and we're going, you know, five miles, like if somebody can't keep up with us at 10 miles an hour, that actually is kind of a problem. Like, um, and sometimes people do turn off, you know, maybe they haven't ridden a bike in 10 or 15 years. Maybe they've got a, a little kid with them, like five or six years old, who's not able to keep up. Once in a while, people do separate themselves. But um, yeah, I think we need to be clear about it's not I don't think there's any ride that's no drop. We need to be clear about the conditions under which we will drop. Yeah. And yeah, Elias is right. Because we, we do a month, like once a month, we do a gravel, a, like a gravel or trail route. And I am, I am so adamantly like, I, I will make a video, I will post about it like three times. And I'm like, just so you know, this might not be the one for you today. Like that, it, it, you're, you're totally right. Because I try to be as clear as possible. Um, that when we do the like trail route, especially because we're leaving from Portland, and the selection of like gravel, and trail roads in Portland, uh, some of them are pretty rough. Some of them are pretty technical, but to connect them all, it's a fun ride. And like folks like to do it. Like everyone who goes on that ride usually has a great time, but I try to be as clear as possible uh, like in, in what Elias is saying that this one might not be for you. Um, but it still is, we still have like, Nick has done essentially like 
a, a trail riding course with a couple people who were at the back one time who had like it was their first time ever doing trails and they basically got like a private lesson and it ended up being really cool like it was a good time positive experience yeah yeah and and taylor thanks for the plug one of the things that the bicycle coalition does offer is we, we offer trail skills courses for riding off-road we have urban riding courses for people that are new to the idea of riding with traffic as a part of traffic and this year we're going to have several a learn adult learn to ride courses as well for people who have no previous experience on a bicycle um, so look for those in our events as well <clears throat> we're wrapping up on one hour is there anyone in the audience who would like to unmute or uh, and ask a question shane thanks for your earlier questions those were really good I put this in the chat, but shameless plug for uh, BCM's event page. Uh, if anyone is hosting rides, um, you either email me direct, anne at bikemain.org, or you can actually submit the uh, events on our events page and we'll put them up for you. But um, we love, you know, filling that calendar with all the rides that are out there because hopefully it'll let people know, you know, some of them are going to be fast uh, meant for people who are, you know, avid riders. Some are going to be much more laid back, and we want to show our uh, membership base that, you know, there's really something for everyone. Yeah. All right. Well, I have one more question, and well, two more, but one more is what what do you do when someone has this happened? I guess what happens if someone shows up on an e-bike? I'm assuming probably most of you are accommodating to that. What if shows up when someone shows up on a scooter or an electric scooter or some other form of micro mobility? Do you have a a go to response for people like that? Well, shout out to one wheel guy. I just call him one wheel guy. I don't oh, know yeah. his name, but uh, we we have one wheel guy who started coming to bike party and uh, also. Uh, rollerblader who became one of our best and fastest safeties he could get from the, the back to the front of our ride faster than any bike um so all are welcome cool as long as they ride yeah cool. yeah we've got folks on e-bikes but uh one of the first rides uh i think someone who goes to bike party was on a more of like one of those like electric little motorcycle kind of bikes like something with a throttle and not necessarily like an e-bike um and we got to the headlight and then he ended up like turning around and bouncing just because i i just don't know that he like realized that it was really more of like a group road ride than like a bike party-esque kind of thing um so since then i haven't really had anything like that but i mean he was totally he was fine to be on the ride he, i just think he we got halfway through and he was just like i don't think this is what i thought it was so but we we definitely have some people on some on some like average e-bikes too. Are you we, saying, we have, Tyler? Sort of, if you yeah. got wheels, join, please. Yeah, I, we haven't encountered anyone that's on anything other than bikes. Um, we actually haven't even had any any e-bikes, which I, I actually would very much welcome e-bikes. Um, I think it's um you know um being somebody who is regularly around bikes and talks about them. Uh, as a job, um, I, I think uh, the conversation of e-bikes is one that's really exciting to me because it opens that door to to so many more people to be able to ride. Um, but there are kind of conditions where e-bikes do have to kind of pay attention to things a little differently on on group rides. Um, you know, being you know that a lot of people are going to be using them on hills and stuff. They they do act differently on a hill compared to uh, how regular bikes would. Um, so I think it's actually again as as per our kind of you know normal idea that we go with is that it's it's an education experience. Um, so I very much welcome you know e-bikes on our on our ride. Um, we haven't had any scooters uh, or such show up. Um, I suppose that would be something we would have to tackle in the moment because I'm actually not 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 100 percent sure. Yeah. OK, last question before we kind of go to a wrap up here. What's one mistake? And we have like four minutes. So if you could spend one minute explaining, like, what's one big mistake you've made in the developing in the development of these groups that you would like to put out there so others can learn from it? Tyler, you want to go first? Well, uh, I, I would say 
we overthink things a lot <laughs> uh and that kind of maybe gets us spiraling down like uh did we do this right do we do this wrong should we do this differently which i think is is healthy in in some ways but um a lot of our conversations have been um a course about inclusivity uh and and how to navigate that and um yeah it's it's a really really tough question to to, to navigate um because we never want to end up in a scenario so i guess this is more uh premonition but like we don't want to end up in a scenario where we've ousted somebody who who wanted to be part of a ride and then felt like they couldn't so um i don't think that we've had anything happen um necessarily that we we regret or anything like that yet but i guess um ours is more a precautionary conversation we've been having about like how do we make sure that we continue doing this thing correctly emma yeah well for me what comes to mind is um, in one of the earlier rides, it was just when the bike party was starting to get a little bit bigger, um, but maybe we were still probably under 100 people. And somebody came with her cargo bike. It was one of those front bucket bikes, like um, Copenhagen style. And she had a couple kids in the bike. Um, I can't remember if it was an e-bike or not, but she was towards the back and we were doing the, um, we were on the Eastern prom and we were on the trail. I think the bike just was, she was having a hard time navigating in the crowd and around some of the corners. And um, she ended up dropping and I didn't get a chance to talk to her. And that, when we were talking about no drop earlier, like people sometimes do leave the ride. And, but I feel like with the numbers and the volunteers we have, and, and when it was smaller, just like having, wanting it to feel inclusive, like I would always try to go up or have someone go up to that person and be like, hey, how you doing? And sometimes they'd be like, oh, I'm headed to meet a friend. Or they would say like, this is too hard for me. But in this case, I didn't get to talk to this person and um, heard, because Portland's a small town, friend of a friend that she felt like it wasn't inclusive. Like she just wished she had, I don't know, had known um, how fast we were going or where we were going. So I would say planning your route and communicating, like, like was said earlier, being being as clear as you can and then knowing that um not it's not going to work for everybody but like being a friendly face and like trying to learn from those things and just seeing if you can connect with those people in the moment if they're willing to share um would be my takeaway from that yeah for sure i agree emma um taylor how about any big mistakes other people can learn from um it was actually brought up in the chat earlier um i mean this is like a little a kind of like a maybe like a little mistake, but in, in my safety spiel that I give at the beginning, um, Tyler's heard me yell at a bunch and a few of the other folks here that have, have been to the Thursday. Um, I did forget to uh, teach car back because we do have like new, we had a decent amount of new people coming in um, that maybe hadn't been on a group ride before and don't know how to communicate in a group. So just, uh, I wish I had like really planned out my spiel a little bit more and like really thought through it and written it down because I do remember I forget things in the moment when you're like standing in front of a bunch of people and hoping that you're giving them all the safety info that you need that I just really I wish that I had just remembered to have it all written down or rehearsed a little bit better um yeah and so for anyone who would like a written document like our website bikemain.org we have several handouts and some of them are really easy to to absorb and the information's just like here's how you here's how you drive your bicycle best practices so that's always available and i liked i liked how san jose bike party and maybe some of your sites do too they just kind of have it there in a visual form some people are great at auditory and other people just need to see it so they can absorb the information um elias you want to finish us out here biggest mistake ever that people can learn from Oh, I was trying to think real hard about that. Um, the the one I came up with was the one that keeps going, which is uh, just the basics of like contact information, like where we're going to meet, what time. Um, last month, I didn't highlight that enough. And I had a bunch of people asking what time. And I was like, oh, it's in there. But I didn't you know, specifically spell it out. Um, being super, super clear about th those kind of things. Um, it, it's amazing, like how difficult it is to communicate that kind of information. So any sort of schedule changes or location, like, you know, getting all those kind of fundamentals locked, locked down. Mm. Hey, shout out to Patrick too. We got a, another um, bike Biddeford Sacco uh, ride founder on the line here. Um, Patrick Conley. 
Yeah. Peace, Patrick. Thank you. Um, could, you got a second? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say, yeah, thanks, Elias. And um, I, yeah, I started an organization in Biddeford, Saco called Bike BS. And we started doing what I call light up rides, which is similar to a bike party. Um, this will be our third summer doing them. And um, my experience is really similar to yours, Eric, that that my first experience with um, group riding was a critical mass ride in, in Manhattan with thousands of people. And at the time I was living in Jersey City, New Jersey, and I was president of organization there by, by uh, bike B or bike JC. And uh, we started light up rides there about 10 years ago. Um, and I used to lead lead those. So I a lot of experience with doing this kind of stuff. And I, I would say, you know, Portland Bike Party has it together. It's great. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we're doing the same thing in Biddeford Saco on a much smaller scale, but it's growing and we're having a good time with it. And, uh, you know, all the safety things, you know, for sure. Oh, well, thanks, Patrick, for sharing. And I'm going to, I'd like to, I'll email you later, but, and for everyone else here, um, so that we can get some show notes and include how anyone that's listening to this now or in the future can actually connect with your organizations and join one of these rides, which sounds super fun. So I'll look for that email to come soon. Thank you for everyone for joining and listening. Thank you all the guests for coming and sharing everything that you've learned over the years. Thank you again to Tandem Coffee for sponsoring and check us out on YouTube if you missed it. Well, if you missed it, you've got this far, so you haven't missed it. <laughs> but We'll put this on YouTube. We're going to put it on Spotify for anyone. Uh, so please share. And uh, any final thing to say by anyone? Have fun, red bikes. I love it. Fun, <laughs> red bikes. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Bye, all.